In this video, we're going to take a look at creating joints inside of the assembly environment for Inventor. Now, the joints are actually a newer tool, and they can actually speed up your process of constraining parts in place or relating components in place, uh, because they actually do some automatic controls, and you get some nice visual features with the joint command as well. Now, the joint command is this first command here on the Relationships panel. So I'm on the Assemble tab, Relationships panel there, got Joint. When I start that command, I do have a dialog box for this, as well as a mini toolbar. And I can basically see there's a lot of things here about joints. So the very first thing I'm going to look at is type. So on type, I have automatic as an option, as well as rigid, rotational, slider, cylindrical, planar, and ball. I can also select that on the mini toolbar towards the right with these commands as well. So an automatic joint, what that basically does is based on the selections that I pick, if I pick a rotational edge or a curvature, if I pick on a planar surface, and depending on what I click on second, it's going to try to choose of these joints which one best makes sense. Now, the rigid and rotational ones are probably the most common joints that you're going to use. The rigid one will take your components and put them together and remove all your degrees of freedom. The rotational one will put your components together but leave a rotational degree of freedom open, so very similar to an insert constraint. The slider joint will allow a component to slide upon each other but not rotate at all. A cylindrical joint is very similar to an axial mate. So if you mated two axes together with a normal constraint command, they'd be able to slide along each other's axes. So that's what a cylindrical joint will do. We also have planar, which is very similar to a standard just mate of two faces. And then we have a ball joint, which is similar to a point-to-point -point mate as well. Now, what's nicer about joints compared to doing these things as constraints, because as I mentioned, a couple of these can be done with very similar constraint types. With a joint, you can actually lock your degrees of freedom, so you don't have to go back in and lock it a different way with a second or third constraint to get the movement locked in the way you want. Now, the other things we have in this dialog here, or in the mini toolbar, either one, is we do have to make our connection references. And as we move around an object, we do get to see our different connection references we can pick on. A couple of rules with joints. You don't want to grab on a grounded component like this one here. This is our first component in, so that one's grounded. A couple other things you can notice, though, if I come in here, if I let my cursor sit here for a moment, I get the option to have this stay here on this set of faces, but move between these three different dots. So, and actually to get the center of this block, I actually want that dot to the left there, the green dot. Now, in order to get it, I can hold down control, and then I can just move my cursor through there to try to control the filtering of what the joint tool is trying to pick up. So it's a very handy tool with the joint command, is to be able to use control here to get a better selection on what you want. After that, it's all about making the proper selections. What I'm going to do is just pan over here a little bit. Again, I'm inside of the assembly joints one IAM from our working files directory. Now, I typically don't use a dialog up here. So this new joint tool actually has a nice little button here on the mini toolbar. So you can actually show and close your dialog pretty easily with this little set of buttons. It's one of the only mini toolbar commands that has that functionality. So I'm going to start off with an automatic joint here. And I'm going to choose this curvature reference here. And go to this curvature reference here. You can see it automatically try to choose rotational for me, and it's rotating it to show me that it has that movement. It's a nice little visual acuity there for me. As I look at it, though, I can see that part of the rubber stopper is actually inside the block. I want it outside the block. So I do have some connector flips up here on the mini toolbar to flip this connection around for how I chose my axes or my curvatures there. And that's what I want. And I can go ahead and apply that, or I can say OK. I'm just going to say OK in this case. And you'll see that I still have rotational movement. Again, that could have been accessed with just a standard insert constraint compared to a joint. But now that this has been created, if I look in my tree under the rubber holder, I see I have a rotational joint, which I could then lock. Locking the rotational joint by right-clicking on it allows me to come in here and see that I no longer have degrees of freedom there. Now that's not the exact same thing as a grounded state. A grounded state means that if this block were to move, then that rubber stopper, because it's grounded, doesn't go anywhere. If it's locked, it at least stays locked to this component in that rotational lock. So it gives me more flexibility to move components around that might also be related to this particular rubber stopper. So it gives me a little bit more freedom when I lock these components compared to grounding them. 
Now, what if I wanted to do a rigid connection there? A rigid actually would have locked that for me without having to come back in there and do it separately. So I'm gonna delete this rotational joint. I'm gonna restart my joint command. And this time I will force it to be automatic. So let me move this out of the way. Restart joint. Here I'll do rigid. I'll make the same selections. And as it goes in here now, it's gonna do a little wiggle for me to show me that it's a rigid connection. Do the same flip there. Flip that grommet around. Here we go. Now if you ever want to see the animation again, you can actually click on these little buttons again to get your dialog box back. And you can click the animate button again to do a quick little shimmy there to show you what it can still do. So here I actually have a fully locked in component without having to go back and lock it either. So it's a nice rigid connection. I'm going to continue doing some joints here with these other components. In this case, I'm going to choose the back end of this one. Now again, this is on automatic. So when I come in here and select this, it assumes I want rotational be zero circular edges. Now that ended up being okay but I probably could have gotten off better with a rigid connection and forcing it that way. All right, and that's actually the orientation I want it to be in. I want this to be upside down. If I disagreed with it, I could do an alignment flip as well here on my mini toolbar. I can also do the component flip here, but of course that really doesn't make much sense. So I'm just gonna do these alignment flips and I'm gonna go ahead and apply that. Still inside this command, I'm going to go up here to my threaded rod next. Notice I can get the center of this threaded rod, or the ends. So here I'll pick up the center, and I want the center of this block. So again, I'm going to hold down control to make sure I get the dot in here that I want. I want this one. This has chosen a cylindrical joint. So this is trying to move it along each other's axes. Now as I look at this, it's actually a little bit off from where I want it. So I could come in here and still do an offset value. So let me find that joint. I'll do an edit. Now actually, since this was on the center point, it doesn't allow me to really adjust this one too much. So what I'm gonna do is actually delete that cylindrical. Try that one again. Get this point here. And there's orientation I wanted. Just had to be one more dot away from it. There we go. Next up, I'm gonna do some rigid joints with these two nut washers. But before I do that, I should need to have these slot runners on top of this. So I'm gonna start my joint again. I'll keep it on automatic. So put a rotational joint in for me. Okay, you can still do your flips there as well. I'm okay with that one. Do joint again. Now with these, I do absolutely want a rotational degree in here. So there we go. Coming back and looking at this piece here though, I, I actually changed my mind, I want that flipped upside down. So I'm going to go back to that cube 45 and edit that one. There's my flip, here we go. Again, this is nice and locked in place here, whereas this one has a rotational degree of freedom. Now I'm going to do a rigid joint with this curvature here to this curvature here. I'll flip that around. Same thing with this one. Just double check that one there. Yep, rigid, good. Every time you restart the command, it will begin with automatic again. It won't remember the last one you used. So just be aware of that. So this is how I want to save assembly joints one. Now I go over to assembly joints two, which I also have open. I'm going to place in assembly joints one for my working files directory. So I got the subassembly now, and I can still apply joints in here as well. So I'll go to my joint tool, and here I'll do automatic again, that's fine. I'll attach this one here. Should want to have a little bit of a flip on that one instead. The alignment. Make sure I'm getting that lined up the right way. There we go. Go ahead and apply that. Now as I move this one around, you can see the bucket doesn't move, even though I did have a rotational movement at this area of the subassembly. So how do I open up freedom that I might have inside of subassemblies with their degrees of freedom? Well, you have to do something called flexible. 
a flexible subassembly will allow it to use those degrees of freedom of the lower subassembly hierarchy. So in order to make this bucket assembly here with the, the link arms and the bucket, in order to make that flexible, I'm going to go over to my tree on the right hand side, right click on it, and go here to flexible on assembly joints one. So now this allows me to use degrees of freedom that I might have inside of this subassembly. Now because I did this, I actually have a little bit more openness than I want. So this actually swings around quite a bit. So it looks like I need another joint between this link and the cube to keep this other arm from moving around. So I can do another joint, and then again I'll do automatic. It's important you choose the one you want to move first to the one you want to move second. If I chose the cube first, the cube would try to move over, which might invalidate another joint that I already have. I will get this message here letting me know that I have an existing joint that which when I edit this, it might cause conflict. Again, this is a might. This is cautionary. It's not an error. So I'm going to say yes to that. That's going to move that into position. And you can see the conflict it was talking about was probably removing this one over here. But again, this is flexible. It can use both those degrees of freedom down below. So when I apply this, it still sticks. Now for this one here, in order to keep this bucket at a certain angle, I'm probably just going to apply an angle constraint to that. So if I were to do a joint in this case to lock movement in here, it wouldn't really make a lot of sense. You know, I'd have to kind of put this bucket in a nice neutral position. I can do that with normal constraints still. Just because you chose to assemble most of your design with joints or with constraints doesn't mean you can't use the other. A fair combination of both can create a very robust assembly. So this has been a look at creating joints inside of Autodesk Inventor.